Hey everyone, it's Sarah with RegisteredNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be doing an NCLEX review over appendicitis. And as always in the YouTube description below or at the end of this YouTube video you can access the review quiz that will test your knowledge on appendicitis. So let's get started. First, let's start out talking about what is appendicitis. Appendicitis is the inflammation of the appendix. Now, let's review some anatomy and physiology real fast. Where is the appendix located in the body? Okay, over here on this drawing, we see the basic setup of the gastrointestinal system. We have the stomach, and the stomach leads into the small intestines, which is split up into three parts. We have this area right here, the duodenum, which leads into the jejunum, which leads into the ileum, and that's the small intestines. Now this ileum leads into the large intestine at the cecum. So you have the cecum, and then you have the large intestine, specifically the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, sigmoid colon, and the rectum. But what we're interested in is this area right here, the appendix. So the appendix looks like a finger-like or worm-like area that comes off, actually protrudes off of the cecum of the ascending colon. And it will be located right there. Now, what is the role of your appendix? What does it do? Well, there for a while, um, scientists thought the appendix really didn't do anything. It was just one of those extra structures we have. But it actually has an important role. The function of it is that it plays a role in storing good bacteria in the GI tract after a diarrhea illness. So it helps maintain healthy gut flora. So you get sick, you have extreme diarrhea. Those good bacteria decide to congregate in that appendix until the coast is clear and everything has cleared out. Then once that illness has gone away, they migrate out and repopulate that um, large intestine so you can have that healthy gut bacteria. Now, let's talk about some causes of appendicitis. What causes this? Okay, big cause is obstruction. Something gets inside that lumen of the appendix and causes some problems. And we will talk about that here in a second when we talk about the pathophysiology of this. Okay, some things that can cause obstruction. Most common cause, called a fecula. This is a fancy term for hardened stool that has like literally calcified. And it's got in here, as you can see over here in this drawing, and has blocked the lumen of the appendix. Nothing can get out of the appendix, causes increased pressure, causes a lot of issues, and eventually it can rupture. And when it ruptures, it can go, lead into complications such as perforation, which is rupturing, which will lead to an abscess, then can lead into peritonitis, which if it isn't treated, can lead into shock and then eventually death. Some other things that can cause a blockage are parasites like worms, foreign body, maybe the person ingested, swollen lip node in the lining of the appendix. And around your appendix, you have lip nodes, lip nodal tissue. And if they become too enlarged, especially over a long period of time, it can cause an obstruction in the appendix. Like if the person has constant battles with a viral or bacterial infections, or like with Crohn's, mononucleosis, or gastroenteritis, can cause this. And then another cause other than obstruction is trauma or injury. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of appendicitis. What is going on with the patient? Okay, let's say that it's being caused by an obstruction, specifically a fecula. So the fecula has got in there, caused a blockage. This is going to lead to increased pressure inside that appendix. And as you're going to see here in a second, when you get increased pressure, you can have major, major problems. But first, let's answer the question of why is there increased pressure? Well, inside your appendix is called mucosa lining. And mucosa lining secretes mucus and fluids. So you have that being secreted, but you have a blockage. So that's not going anywhere. It's going to be staying in there and you have bacteria that are already in the appendix that are gonna to start to multiply and get a lot more of them. So you have all of this stuff and it can't go anywhere. It's staying there and it just continues to grow. And as that goes, 
you have increased pressure. The pressure keeps building and building and building. Now, within 48 to 72 hours, once appendicitis sets in, the patient is at major risk for perforation rupture. So, physician needs to get in there, treat it, maybe an appendectomy, and get this appendix removed before we have perforation. Now, what results from this increased pressure? Because we don't like the pressure buildup. It's gonna cause problems. So as that pressure builds, you start to get major venous obstruction. And this is gonna cause occlusion of blood flow. And that current blood that's already there because it can't move anywhere, starts to become stagnant. And we don't like stagnant blood because what does blood do whenever it stands still? It starts to coagulate. It will form a blood clot, a clot. Now, whenever that happens, you're going to get ischemia to the appendix. So it's going to slowly start dying. The walls of the appendix right here are gonna start getting really weak and they're gonna start breaking down. And what's gonna happen when those walls break down from that ischemia? It's going to spill all of its contents into the abdominal cavity, which is peritonitis, which will lead to peritonitis. And at the site of where it ruptured, you're going to get an abscess, which is a collection of pus, and you're gonna have white blood cells, all that good stuff there at that site. Now, we do not want that to happen, but unfortunately, it does happen to some patients. So whenever peritonitis sets in after the appendix is ruptured, it can lead to septic shock and eventually death if the patient is not treated. Now let's look at the major signs and symptoms of appendicitis that you need to know as the nurse. And to help you remember those, remember the word appendix because that is what we are dealing with. Okay, so A, A for abdominal pain. Your patient will definitely have this. And it may start out as, out as dull around the belly button and then radiate down to the right lower quadrant where it will localize. So remember, right lower quadrant. It's not the left, it's the right lower quadrant. Okay, P for point of McBurney's. Uh, McBurney's point is where, the pain, is where the pain will be the most intense on the patient. Now, where is McBurney's point? Okay, McBurney's point, if you look on the abdomen, find the belly button, and then find where the anterior superior iliac spine would be. And it's a distance, about one third distance between those. So about right there where you see the red dot. This is where the patient is gonna have the most intense pain which makes sense because that's about where the appendix will be. Okay, P for poor appetite, E for elevated temperature, N for nausea and vomiting, D for desire to be in the fetal position. So the patient, in order to relieve pain, you're gonna see the patient over on their side, laying with their knees bent. And that actually makes the pain a little less intense. So if you see your patient doing that, having abdominal pain, all these other signs and symptoms, that should be a red flag going off. Hey, appendicitis. An eye for increased white blood cells, with everything going on, the inflammation, we expect that. I for inability to pass gas. Patient will report that or stool. Um, a lot of patients are constipated. However, some patients can have diarrhea. It depends on the patient, but those are some signs and symptoms. And then the last part, X for experience. Patient's going to experience rebound tenderness or abdominal rigidity. Let's talk about rebound tenderness. Okay, if physician or you goes and places pressure specifically in that right lower quadrant where McBurney's point is, whenever you're pressing Pressure, putting pressure, it hurts. But when you actually let go, the, pre, the pain is a lot more intense and more painful, hence rebound tenderness. So that's a telltale sign. And then abdominal rigidity is where palpating on the abdomen and there's, and there's involuntary um, flexion of the abdominal muscles. It becomes rigid. 
Now let's look at the pre-op and the post-op nursing care for a patient with appendicitis. One of the most common treatments for appendicitis is an appendectomy, where a surgeon goes in and removes the appendix. And it's usually done via an open surgery or a laparoscopic one. So let's look at pre-op care first. Okay, as the nurse who's caring for this patient with appendicitis, who's gonna be going for an appendectomy, you want to monitor that patient's vital signs and looking for signs and symptoms that the appendix may have perforated, ruptured, or they're having peritonitis where the appendix ruptured and it spilled its contents into the abdomen and they're into that. So some signs and symptoms that has happened. Okay, caring for the patient, you want to be always monitoring their pain level and making sure it's staying at a certain amount because if a patient tells you, oh, my pain is gone, I have some relief, that is not a good sign. The patient may see, think it's a good sign because they're not having pain anymore, but it's because the appendix was ruptured, so there's no longer that appendix there. Instead, it spilled everything into the abdominal cavity, and that will be followed up by some very intense pain. So patient tells you, ooh, I feel better, my pain is gone. You need to watch out that the appendix may have ruptured. Okay, signs of peritonitis. Maybe appendix is ruptured, patient really didn't tell you, um, and you start to see these signs and symptoms like an increased heart rate, they're tachycardic, they're starting to breathe really fast, they have an increased temperature, and you notice that the abdomen is more distended and there's bloating from where that contents has spilled into the abdominal cavity. That, those are telltale signs and need to no notify the physician immediately. And of course, you'll be keeping the patient nothing by mouth for surgery and trying to help them with pain relief. Depending on the physician, um, they tend to limit pain medication because you want to monitor that pain of that patient. Um, so you'll be doing some non-pharmacological techniques like positioning. Remember teaching the patient how to get in the fetal position with the knees bent that helps to relieve a lot of pain until they can get to surgery. And a big thing you want to remember, now the patient's going to be in a lot of pain. A lot of times when people have abdominal pain, they wanna put a heating pad on their stomach. But with appendicitis, no heat application onto the stomach because it can increase the chance of that appendix rupturing. So no heat, you can do ice if you need to, but not heat. Um, also, no enemas or laxatives, and the patient's probably going to say, um, because remember with one of our signs and symptoms was inability to pass gas, feeling constipated, that makes a person feel really uncomfortable, so they may request an enema or a laxative to feel better, but you can't do that because it can increase um, the appendix um, to rupture. Okay, now let's look at the post-op nursing care. Okay, patient's back from their appendectomy. What are you going to be watching for? Of course, you're gonna be monitoring their vital signs, especially temperature, they spiking temperatures, maybe there's an infection, so you wanna watch that. And you're gonna be monitoring the surgical site for any signs of infection, like excessive yellowish nasty drainage, or extreme redness, um, things like that. And if the patient comes back from surgery with a drain, a lot of times if the appendix ruptured, the patient will have a surgical drain in place and you'll wanna maintain that per doctor's order. And this drain is gonna drain some excessive drainage. So expect that because it's draining the irrigation that they use in surgery to wash out that cavity, the abdominal cavity. Because remember peritonitis, it spills all the contents in there and they have to go in and wash all that out. So that will be draining from there. And the drain is usually removed when the drain stops draining. So you wanna make sure you know how much the drain has been putting out because the physician may ask you and they'll base that on if they should remove the drain or not. And positioning usually with a drain because you wanna help with gravity, getting them on their right side to help that drain, drain that drainage out of there because we don't want it just to set in the gut and fester. Another thing is having the patient ambulate after surgery, getting them up. We wanna prevent blood clots because they're at risk for that after you have surgery, so we want them up moving. Using the incentive spirometer, if you're not familiar with how to do that, I have a video about an incentive spirometer and an NCLEX review, and you can access that up in a card if you wanna watch that. And coughing and deep breathing and splinting their surgical site when they do that. 
Reasons we want to do that is to prevent pneumonia from setting in because after you've had surgery, you're in pain, you don't want to cough and deep breathe or breathe very well. You want to do those shallow breaths, but we want good deep breaths to expand those lungs, keep those alveoli popped open, and we don't want secretions just to set in there and fester and turn into pneumonia. Um, you're going to administer IV antibiotics. Usually this is ordered if the patient had a ruptured appendix to um, help with infection and pain meds as ordered by the physician. Sometimes a patient may have a nasogastric tube, an NG tube. If that's present, you'll want to maintain that and that will be there to remove any stomach fluids and swallowed air. And the patient usually is kept NP, nothing by mouth NPO until it's removed. Another big thing you want to be doing at, whenever you're doing your assessments is you want to be monitoring their bowel sounds. Do you hear any sounds? You want to hear sounds. That's a good thing. You don't hear sounds. Not very good. And you want to ask this patient this simple question. Are you passing gas? Because if they're passing gas, that lets us know, hey, our GI system's working. It's passing gas. Maybe they haven't had a bowel movement yet, but good sign that they're passing gas. And of course, you want to assess if they've had a bowel movement. Um, they need to have a bowel movement within two to three days after having this surgery. And if not, you need to further evaluate that and see what's going on. In diet, they will start out slow, reintroducing foods like with clears, if they tolerate that, no nausea, vomiting, keeps that down, advanced fools, and then eventually solid food. And they want to follow a high fiber diet um, just to keep that stool soft so they don't strain whenever using the bathroom. Now, as a side note, just wanna add this in here. If the patient had the surgery done laparoscopic way, and you need to let them know that they may have shoulder pain for a few days, and that's because whenever they did surgery, they inflated the abdomen with carbon dioxide to push the abdominal wall away from the internal organs so they can see the appendix to operate. And as that gas is leaving, it can cause patients some shoulder pain. So just be aware of that. Okay, so that wraps up our lecture on appendicitis. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.